Hello and welcome to the Legal Edition. I'm your host, Attorney Mary Kay Loyan. Our show topic today is running on fumes, biofuels, the environment, and your health. Our discussion focuses on empirical scientific data showing a troubling correlation between biofuel use, toxins in the environment, and the prevalence of COVID-19. Our guest is Dr. Stephanie Seneff. She is a senior research scientist at MIT. Let's welcome Dr. Stephanie Seneff. Welcome, Dr. Seneff. Thank you for having me on, my pleasure. Now, you've been doing a lot of research in the area of biofuels. Tell us what you have found that you believe is so very harmful. Well, it's really a lot of research in glyphosate, and then I happen to be looking into vaping, vaping lung disease before COVID-19 hit. And so when COVID-19 hit, I was primed. And I observed that the symptoms of COVID-19 are very, very similar to the symptoms of people who are getting serious lung issues when they vape, when they smoke e-cigarettes. And I was aware that e-cigarettes were derived from glycerol, which is a byproduct of the, of the biofuel industry. So I was, I was focused on the idea that glyphosate might be in the glycerol as a consequence of the fact that the biofuel industry basically takes uh, crops and food, uh, waste food and crops and, and turns them into usable fuel. It's an industry that's been growing rapidly in the last few years. And there's uh, leaders in the field are United States and Brazil. And those two countries are also the biggest consumers of glyphosate. So the, the biggest consumers of biofuels and the biggest consumers of glyphosate. And glyphosate in the glycerol maps to potentially glyphosate in the biofuels and when you start to see cities like New York City going crazy, when, they, when, when COVID-19 first hit this country, it hit really hard on New York City. I mean, it was clearly, it's an international city. It has a lot of flights coming in, lots of chances to pick up the virus. But it, the question is, when the virus arrives, does it blossom into this huge problem or does it just slowly start populating the hospital? So in New York, there was just this incredible hit where you know, ICUs were overflowing. It was very clear they had a huge problem back in April, and that really kind of made the country aware that this was a serious disease. But the thing that I feel is that uh, people who are exposed to glyphosate, this is what I'm working out as a theory, mm -hmm. people who are exposed to glyphosate through the lungs by virtue of breathing glyphosate contaminated air or smoking glyphosate contaminated fumes from the glycerol are more, much more susceptible to a toxic response to COVID-19, that their immune system in their lungs has been compromised by the chronic exposure to glyphosate, such that it's unable to launch an appropriate response to clear the viruses. And the result is that um, the viruses go crazy. They start multiplying you know, out of control, and then they're coughing up lots of viruses. The next door neighbor's catching it too. So the virus is really flourishing in this environment where everybody's got this lung problem that's keeping them from being able to check, keep the virus in check. So you're saying there's a, a relationship between the glycerol and COVID-19? Yeah, so it starts with the glycerol, which is what I was already looking at. I was th thinking in terms of, because of the e-cigarettes, and I was reading about these very, very interesting uh, problem with people smoking e-cigarettes getting this strange lung disease that it wasn't something people were familiar with before. And it's really a toxic uh, 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 a damage to the lung in a very specific way that causes this dry cough and this um, uh, sense of not being able to breathe, not be able, being able to get enough oxygen, you know, shortness of breath and slightly high fever. I mean, it's it, a dry cough, so it's not a lot of mucus and it's not a runny nose. I mean, this is what you see with COVID-19, exactly those same symptoms. It's exactly the same symptoms as COVID-19. And my concern was, I was looking at the e-cigarette to think what is in there that's different from regular cigarettes. I mean, nicotine could have glyphosate in it because it, uh, tobacco is a GMO Roundup Ready crop. They use glyphosate on, on tobacco. And so it probably is in the tobacco. And I've always been concerned about cigarettes, possibly. The damage that cigarettes are doing to health could be, it may be even in large part due to the toxic chemicals that are in the cigarettes, not just the glyphosate. There's lots of toxic chemicals. People always blame the nicotine because they like to blame the things that are not going to put them on the hook. You know, <laughs> the industry likes to always think the blame goes someplace else. But I was suspecting glyphosate in cigarettes. And then with e-cigarettes having such a dramatic effect on the lungs, it's like something more going on than just the nicotine. And that's where I looked at the glycerol and realized glycerol is sort of the major byproduct of the biofuels industry. When you convert 
the, what they do is like, for example, let's take wheat. They spray the wheat with glyphosate right before harvest as a de desiccant. They harvest the wheat. Of course, lots of glyphosate goes into the bread as a consequence of that. Then they take all the stubble that's left over and they, and they dump, dump it on, they gather it up and dump it on a barge and ship it down to New York, New York City and run mm -hmm. it through processing at these plants, which then turns it into usable biofuel. And then the byproduct that comes out of that is the glycerol. That part doesn't go into the fuel and ends up as a byproduct. And so glycerol is dirt cheap. And then that's probably what inspired them to invent e-cigarettes e in the first place, I would guess, is because there was all this extra glycerol that was you know, very inexpensive because there was so much of it being generated from the biofuel industry. Why not find a purpose for it? And, um, but the glycerol, you know, I think the glycerol is contaminated with glyphosate and I think the biofuels are contaminated. Now this all needs to be proven. It's all speculation at this point, but the, uh, but the way it lines up with COVID-19 is just absolutely in incredible. Yeah, talk about that because you've done research on, on countries that aren't using the glyphosate and they have a different COVID-19 response. Is that correct? Absolutely. That's what's been so fascinating to me. And I've just been pouring over the data on the COVID. It's great. We have so much data coming in every day from the web. And so it's hard to keep track of it all, but it's quite fascinating. And, you know, people are mumbling, why is it that Africa's doing so well? You know, it's just crazy. Uh, and I especially focused in on Nigeria. And, and this also gets back to the air pollution issue because people are aware that air pollution is a risk factor. There's no question about it. A, a really nice Harvard study um, looked at um, counties all across the United States. And they looked at the correlation between air pollution measured as nanoparticles. They look at the nanoparticles in the air. And that's a number you can get you know, from data sources. And they compared that to death rates from COVID-19. They found a statistically significant correlation. So they said air pollution is a risk factor. Mm -hmm. And we saw, you know, in Italy, Lombardy really got hit hard. That was another place. Yes, they did. They did. Spot, they did spot early on. Yes. So, you know, yeah. I know you and, have and that was air pollution as well. So the thing is, the air pollution is a risk factor, you know? That's why you look at countries in Asia that have serious air pollution. You look at Nigeria. Nigeria is one of the top countries and 94 percent of the people i think i have some picture on that here yes uh, you show us your chart that will really put this in perspective for us yeah i've got various things to show you well here's this what might the toxic substances be um okay which describes uh, all the possibilities in the air because air pollution does have a lot of things in it and they're not thinking of glyphosate they're never thinking of glyphosate in air pollution but you know nitrogen oxide sulfur dioxide carbon monoxide cyanide nanoparticles is a big one, and then lead and other toxic metals, all those things are in the air pollution and can cause trouble. But then there's the question of glyphosate, and that's what I put in red at the bottom. Is there glyphosate in the air pollution when there are a lot of biofuels involved, and then not when there aren't? That's what I'm thinking, is that that's the distinguishing factor that makes air pollution toxic versus well, not. Well, we know, we know it's in the rain. We, that yes. is measurable. So yes. if it's in the rain, it's obviously in the rest of the year. Exactly. If the rain is picking it up, then where is it getting it from, right? Exactly. <laughs> it's like exactly. it's getting it from the air. And in fact, Anthony Samsel has been doing, a, he's a, he collaborates with me and he's been doing, having people send samples of, of rainwater from various places. And I gave him a sample from my home in Winchester, Massachusetts, and another sample from my office at MIT in Cambridge. And my Winchester sample came out negative and my Cambridge sample came out positive. Really? Glyphosate. And that makes sense because Cambridge is a city. It's got a lot of buses and trucks and those things often are driving diesel fuel, biodiesel fuel. And of course, the, gas the uh, ga gasoline it has in the United States is a big leader in bio uh, bioethanol in the gasoline. So we have like 10% ethanol, in most of our gasoline in this country. That's unusual. Most countries ha have much less and many have zero. And so, you know, Europe is a leader in biodiesel and they are, they are really big in that space and uh, much more so than we are actually for cars. I mean, we have biodiesel trucks and, and buses, but, but Europe has biodiesel cars, well, cars I'm, running on biodiesel fuel. I know, it, I know here in the state of Massachusetts, they're selling biofuel for, uh, for home heating and it has 20% biofuels. Wow, that's amazing. I've been really wondering about home heating oil, actually, and I've been trying hard to get data and I haven't succeeded uh, with the nursing homes because I'm suspecting uh, biodiesel he home heating oil in the nursing homes may be causing, increasing their risk. I mean, they're already elderly, they're already sick, so they have all those risk factors. 
but some of the nursing homes are getting hit really hard. There was one in, um, it was just a showcase of one in Belmont, um, Belmont Manor, I think it was called, and it was an old building, you know, that had been, it's supposed to be a very outstanding nursing home uh, and high end, you know, highly, highly rated. And they got hit hard by COVID-19 and it was kind of like, they were sort of thinking it should be the ones that, you know, aren't so expensive that are more, you know, low end that would be the ones that they'd hit hard, but they couldn't understand why this one would be. And I could not figure out whether they use um, biodiesel home heating oil, but you know, it's, it's, it's a possibility because old buildings in New England uses a lot of heating oil. New York City is the only city in the, in the world, perhaps the only one I've found that actually requires at least 5% bio in home heating oil in New York City. It's required by law. And in New York State, you get a tax break if you have over 5% in your home heating oil. So there's a big encouragement in New England to, to, use, to, 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 to use biodiesel as much as possible, biofuel as much as possible for home heating oil, you know, for gasoline, put the ethanol in there, uh, trucks and buses. New York City has like 11,000 buses that run on, or, or buses that run on uh, biodiesel fuel. So, you know, New York City's got a lot of, it's a very big um, player in the biodiesel uh, industry and very proud of it, by the way, people are, saying that biodiesel is um, you know, good for the, for the earth and trying to reduce the consumption of fossil fuels and supposedly you know, reducing the carbon emissions. But as you and I both know, that's not necessarily true, right? Right, there's, there's documentation that says that the whole process of creating the biofuel and taking out you know, the land that had trees on it actually can contribute to the greenhouse effect. Yeah, and this is a slide I have, which we can put up. That's uh, uh, the conversation. And you showed that link to me, and that was a very interesting article. Biofuels turn out to be a climate mistake, and here's why. And that's what they were initially saying, oh, they're going to help to reduce carbon emissions. But when you do the math, when you look carefully at exactly what's happening and all the step stages that involved with, with biofuels, you end up finding they're a net loss. They're actually making carbon emissions worse. And that's really because often you're taking land that used to be grass or used to be forest, and you're converting it into cropland. And when you do that, you greatly reduce the amount of carbon that gets captured into the soil just because it's a crop instead of, and of course they don't even mention glyphosate, but glyphosate, mm -hmm. I actually think glyphosate is a major player in carbon emissions and in, um, in climate change because glyphosate, it turns out glyphosate suppresses the synthesis of chlorophyll and it also suppresses the synthesis of a, uh, it suppresses the activity of chlorophyll, the synthesis of chlorophyll and the activity of an enzyme that is, uh, it's called Rubisco, R-U-B-I-S-C-O. It's a nickname. This enzyme is fascinating. It's the biggest, the most common enzyme in the world, by far, I think, but certainly the most common enzyme in the world, only present in plants. And it is essential for uh, taking carbon out of the air and turning it into organic matter. So both the chlorophyll, which of course is essential as a catalyst, and this enzyme are affected negatively by glyphosate, which causes the plants to be less, much less able to capture carbon from the air. And that's the critical thing, because you've got all these plants growing all over the globe, all of them busy capturing carbon from the air and putting it into the soil, and they're doing it less efficiently if they're exposed to glyphosate. I think that's crucial, and I, I really wish that somebody would would take a look at glyphosate as being a factor in global climate change, because I suspect it's going to turn out to be the case. Well, unfortunately, with the EPA we have right now, that doesn't seem to be anywhere on the radar. No, I mean, you know, it, it really frustrates me that um, I don't hear a whole, I don't hear anybody really besides myself. A couple of people are mentioning the possibility of glyphosate playing a role in the COVID-19 epidemic. But to me, it's dramatic. And, and really the, the two countries that have had the, that have been the hardest hit, that have the number one, number two deaths uh, from COVID are United States and Brazil. And as I said, both of those are the number one, number two consumers of glyphosate and the number one, number two producers of biofuels. So this fits very, very nicely. All three of those fit together. And Europe has been really hard hit and they've been a leader in biodiesel and they import you know, biodiesel from, um, Argentina. Argentina produces biodiesel from soybeans, GMO Roundup Ready soybeans, sprayed with glyphosate, and then the Europeans use that in their cars. So sounds like a disaster. Sounds I like think really so. a disaster. So what do you suggest? So it's in it's in the tobacco. It's well, the e-cigarettes. It's probably yeah, it's in, in the, the glycerol. It's probably in tobacco as well, but I think it's the glycerol that's causing the problem with the e-cigarettes. And I think there's probably a lot in the glycerol that's really hurting those lungs. 
And I wanted to talk actually about the vaping. I mean, we could go there now, I suppose, sure. with the mice, because it's quite interesting. Uh, first of all, I have this slide on the vaping lung disease, which we can put up that'll just sort of explain that human vaping lung disease. And, um, and that's the e-cigarettes um, causing this um, vaping product, e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury, E-Valley, they call it, E-V-A-L-I. And, um, and they talked about the symptoms in this article and the, the patients, and when you look at the symptoms, they're exactly like COVID-19. And then um, this, this article about the mice is really, I really recommend yes, reading this article. Yes, tell us about that. Because it's so, it's so interesting. And they expose these mice to e-cigarettes for four months, this, the fumes from the e-cigarettes, and they did two experiments. Mice were exposed to them with, with or without the nicotine. So even without the nicotine, they pretty much had the same response, which says it's not the nicotine that's causing the problem. Yeah. And then they, they exposed them for four months, and then they exposed them to the flu virus. Very, very interesting. They exposed them to the flu virus, predicting that they would not be able to respond well. And in fact, they didn't. They got extremely um, strong inflammatory reaction to the flu, which is exactly what we're seeing with COVID-19. Those people who are getting sick have an over exuberant immune reaction to the, to the virus, to the COVID-19 virus. And they end up having lots and lots of inflammation in their lungs with gen drives fluid into the lungs. They feel like they're drowning because they, they can't breathe. You know, all this stuff that happens with these people that had this acute reaction, I think it's because the glyphosate has messed them up. And what they found with these, they looked specifically at their lungs, you know, under the microscope and they figured out the lungs were damaged in specific ways. And that's very interesting to me because it makes sense with respect to glyphosate. And there were two things they saw. One was that there were these surfactant proteins that were uh, reduced, uh, significantly reduced. And those surfactant proteins, these are proteins that go into the surfactants. And those proteins are very clever because they can trap the virus and then allow the, the virus to be cleared by the um, immune cells. So very, very important for trapping and clearing the viruses. It's kind of like if you imagine a fly flying around in the room versus the fly stuck on tar paper, you know, which one would be easier for you to catch and kill? Obviously the one that's trapped, right? right. These viruses can't be trapped because these surfactant proteins are not working that's properly. That's interesting. Very and interesting. that allows them to flourish so the viruses start multiplying and getting out of control that's what causes this inflammatory reaction because you're like, oh my God, the, you know, the innate immune system should have been able to clear the virus, but it couldn't because for one reason, because these surfactant proteins weren't working properly. And so, then the other thing was fatty, fat accumulation inside the macrophages in the lungs. They saw, specifically saw fat accumulating in the lungs, in the macrophages. And that is very reminiscent of what glyphosate is known to do in the, in the liver. I know of another study on rats where they exposed the rats to sub, uh, regulatory levels. Glyphosate at such low levels, they would not have, the EPA would not have considered it to be a problem. And these rats were exposed to this glyphosate over a period of time, and they saw that they accumulated fatty deposits in the macrophages in the liver. So that's exactly, they were exposed orally, it got into the liver. When you're exposed in the lungs, it gets into the lungs, you get the same thing. You get fatty macrophages. The macrophages get, accumulate fat and can't get rid of it. And, and so, what is the result? And what is the result of that? Well, they were, I mean, it's basically like a fatty lung disease, you know, fatty liver disease, fatty lung disease. The macrophages are, are failing. They're, they should, I mean, I believe they should be. Uh, and that for fat those people that don't know what the macrophages do, can you clarify? Oh, yeah, those are, that's the immune cells. Macrophage, they're big eaters, right? They're big eaters. What they do is they eat things, they eat pathogens. So normally the fat macrophages would be able to just eat the viruses and get rid of them. But because of these defects, um, they, they can't be, the viruses can't be easily trapped, so the macrophages can't catch them and then they can't eat them either and that and that is reflected in this uh, defect that they're piling up all this fat because they they aren't able to to use the fat in the appropriate way uh, my guess is they have failed mitochondria because in my research on glyphosate shows that, that glyphosate really messes up the mitochondria they can't generate enough energy and then they don't have uh, capacity to clear the viruses and so the viruses multiply well here's it's a question a made immune system here's a question for you we know that, that COVID has hit um, the communities of color more than they have other communities. Could it be their diet, um, they're eating more fast foods or foods that could be laden more with the glyphosate residue in addition to maybe living in crowded cities and breathing the fume? Could that be at the, at the basis of some of this? I absolutely think so. And of course, we also see that uh, the Blacks have a higher, higher uh, incidences of all these comorbidities. You know, they've shown that, in fact, I have a couple of slides on that as well. They've shown that 
um, all these different diseases that are going up um, that are associated with higher risk for COVID-19 bad outcome. And um, these diseases are, you know, hypertension, so high, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, high blood cholesterol, uh, heart disease, kidney disease, dementia, right? Those are all the conditions that are listed here in New York City as being, those are the top ones here as being uh, risk factors for bad outcome. Now I've got this other chart that shows from Nancy Swanson. Um, her data from her paper, Nancy Swanson wrote a paper, collaborated with several, a couple other people. And she's another scientist. Actually. And these numbers are just stunning. And I don't know if you can see, but he'll put it yes, up there. Yes, I can, I can. Um, they're really stunning because they're um, 0 0.9. Everything is, everything but one is higher than 0 0.95. All these correlations are very, very strong. Those are incredible correlation coefficients. 1.0 is the highest it can be. And this p-value on the, on the end here is, you know, E minus seven, E minus nine, E minus eight. That says seven. So E minus seven says six zeros before the first significant. What, is, what do those numbers signify, though? The p potential or the probability? The likelihood that it could have been, happened by chance. Okay. So it's essentially zero. All of these are essentially zero likelihood that this particular pattern could have occurred by chance. You have to highly suspect correlation means causation. What, so she's had these, you know, these these plots are all over the web. Mm -hmm. And immediately we got pushed back. Oh, correlation doesn't mean causation. I mean, people just dismiss it. Well, that's, that's the, the legal standard. But for you right. and I and people looking at it, it would raise suspicion. It was certainly. But when it's this suspicion. strongly correlated, and there's so many diseases, so you know, people say, "Well, that's ridiculous. One one chemical couldn't cause that many diseases." Well, that does seem like a pretty well, you know. If it's pervasive, strong... it's pervasive in the environment. And for those people who don't know. That's what's used in like Roundup and weed killers. It's the base is one of the basic ingredients of that. And we all know there's been multiple lawsuits on that particular issue. Not Hodgkin's so, lymphoma. Yes, not Hodgkin's lymphoma. They found that it, the juries have found that did occur. So the question to be asked is, you know, if this is in the environment, what else? It is pervasive, is it not? Is right. Well, so you. I said uses more than anybody else, and it's it's the, the number one herbicide used worldwide by far. I think atrazine is number two, and atrazine actually just got banned in Hawaii and other parts of the United States by the EPA. I'm really impressed that they banned atrazine uh, because it's also known to be extremely toxic. But they think glyphosate is safe. I mean, this is the frustration. They think it's safe, and of course, all these diseases are going up. We know a lot. You know, America has a huge problem with obesity, a huge problem. Yes, it does. And obesity is a very strong risk factor. The young people who are dying, many of them are, are morbidly obese. You know, it's really, uh, obesity is caused by glyphosate. I, I really don't doubt that by this point. And there's other chemicals that cause obesity too, because mm -hmm. you need to store mm -hmm. fat soluble chem chemicals in fats in order to protect yourself from them. So mm -hmm. some, of, some people have a natural instinct to put on weight in order to be able to pack these toxic chemicals into those fat cells and get rid of them and not expose the rest of the body. Well, one of the things though, this never breaks down, does it not? Does it stay in the environment? And what is, you know, what is the half-life? How does it you know, break down and decay? Right, I mean, that's another question. And that's one thing, again, where Monsanto, which is who's the maker of glyphosate, they assure us that it breaks down very quickly. Within two weeks, it's gone. If you apply it on the field, it disappears in two weeks. It's absolutely not true. And it, it, there's a lot of depends, you know, there's a lot of conditions under which it will stick around. And um, in fact, in Brazil, there was a study, Brazil uses a lot of glyphosate and they did a study on fields where glyphosate was used on GMO crops. And they found that every year there was more glyphosate in the soil than the year before. In other words, it was accumulating. There was not, it wasn't clearing as fast as it was being added. So there was getting to be more and more each year. So each year they apply it, they have more residue in the soil and it's not breaking down. It's obviously not if it's accumulating, right? Right, right. And then right. there was a study on the ocean that found it was lasting for over a year in the ocean. Oh, so they so, found it also in the ocean water as well. Absolutely. Yeah, they're finding it everywhere. And uh, as I said, in the rain, it was found in the rain, I think, in 86% of the samples in the study done in Kentucky, I believe. So now, it's, it's really pervasive in our environment. And it's all over our food supply, which is where I think we're getting the most exposures through our food. And so you mentioned a very good point about the blacks. Often they're in the food desert of the inner city where the, if you go into those grocery stores at the gas stations, it's just, there's nothing to buy. There's nothing there that I would buy. <laughs> you know, it's all this junk food, candies and crackers and whatnot, potato chips. It's just, uh, 
um, all loaded with glyphosate. So I think the blacks are getting a lot more exposure to glyphosate through their food. They also tend to live in the inner city with high air pollution, and that air pollution is going to be contaminated with glyphosate if they live in one of these cities that they a leader in the biofuels industry. So, so glyphosate has an affinity for the fat? Um, to no, actually, glyphosate is water soluble. Oh. So it's not, it doesn't go into the fats the way the other, I mean, I think it does go into the fats, but through a different reason. It's, it's actually a, an amino acid and it, it gets taken up on amino acid um, transporters. So it, it has a very special uh, way to get into the cells. Uh, very few of the toxic chemicals in our environment are amino acids. And this is one thing that really distinguishes glyphosate. And that's what makes its uh, mechanism of toxicity so insidious because it's not um, immediately obvious that you're being hurt by glyphosate when you get exposed. It's more subtle and it, it gets into your proteins. I believe it's getting into your proteins by mistake in place of the coding amino acid glycine because it is a glycine molecule. It's a complete glycine molecule. It just has some extra stuff stuck on its nitrogen atom. So what do you, what do you suggest? What, what, do, what can, well, I, like I said, this EPA is not going to do anything. In fact, they're trying to make things worse for people that aren't paying attention. Uh, they want to put more uh, oil rigs on public land and they were more fracking and more pollutants and uh, and this is all pollutants. I mean putting mm -hmm. into the environment. So what do you suggest? Do you have any ideas of how we can you know move forward? I mean, I think it's absolutely fabulous that we have a certified organic label that we may not be completely trustworthy, but I think it's an awfully better, greatly better than not having it. And when I shop at the grocery store, we always look for that certified organic label. And uh, we're very religious about only buying certified organic food when we shop. And I think that everybody can do that and everybody should do that. And if we do all do that, then their food will not, will stay on the market and not get sold. I mean, once the, the consumer rebels, they're gonna stop making the food if people won't buy it, mm -hmm. right? It's just, that's just market demand. Right. I think the consumer has a powerful, powerful voice by simply not buying the toxic food. The power of the purse. Yes, exactly. And one last thing I wanted to talk about is it, there, I've also been reading about the biofuels, how they actually gum up the engines and the engines right. don't work as well and don't have the longevity, whether it's a, a lawnmower engine or a car engine. Um, have you found that in any of your research at all? Yeah, actually, I first learned about that when I was looking into Taiwan. Taiwan has an incredible, so they're right next door to China. Right, so they should have yes. lots of exposure from, from the original source of COVID-19. They are, have had seven deaths total and something like 450 cases total in the entire country. That's incredible. It's unbelievably small. They basically don't have COVID-19. So I was immediately interested in Taiwan. I knew that Taiwan uses a lot less glyphosate than we do. I've actually been to Taiwan many times. Uh, my husband was on sabbatical there one year and I spent several months in Taipei, which is the biggest city in Taiwan. And I know Taipei has an air pollution problem because I was, it was the biggest problem I faced when I was there. I really hated the toxic air. Every time I went, it was very, always very overcast, you know, sort of gray. It really was clear they had a problem with air pollution. Um, but they don't have a problem with COVID-19 despite the air pollution problem, right? And um, Taiwan um, does, has very little glyphosate. And Taiwan uh, tried, I was looking on the web to try to find biofuels in Taiwan. And I found a couple of really interesting articles. And they said they tried to put in 1%, that's very tiny, 1% biofuels in the cars. And um, they found it gummed up the engine. And they said that, so they concluded that um, in a humid, hot, humid country like Taiwan, biofuels are not suitable because microbes grow in the biofuels and the microbes gum up the engine. That was their conclusion. So in 2008, they abandoned biofuels altogether. They haven't done anything with biofuels since then. And you know, as a result, they have no COVID-19. I mean, I think that's quite interesting. No, you know, low glyphosate, not none, no GMOs. They, they don't allow GMOs, um, no biofuels, and no And their COVID. death rate from COVID is quite low. It, it's zero, it's basically mean. zero. Seven out of a population of several, I don't know, 20, probably 30 million. I don't know how many people they have. They have a lot. I mean, it's not a small country. It's not Despite near as big as the United States. Despite being close to China, but. the epicenter. This has been a fascinating discussion. I want to thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you so much. Thanks. I want to thank our guest, Dr. Stephanie Seneff, for sharing her research and opinions on biofuels, toxins, and health. 
And I want to thank you, our viewers, for tuning in. For more information on today's topic and our guest, visit us online at thelegaledition.com. And remember, this information is for general educational purposes. It is not legal or professional advice. And don't forget, subscribe online. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter.